Good afternoon from the Indiana State Department of Health. I'm Sarah Kiefer, the Deaf Education Coordinator at the Center for Deaf and Hard of Hearing Education. On behalf of the PATH Project of the Bloomberg Center at Indiana State University, Indiana Hands and Voices, and the Center for Deaf and Hard of Hearing Education, I would like to welcome you to our webinar series, Affecting Positive Outcomes for Children Who Are Deaf and Hard of Hearing. While participating in the webinar, if you have any technical issues, please refer to the technical assistance portion of the email you received containing the information on how to access this webinar. Professional growth points are also available following this presentation. In order to receive a certificate, you will need to participate in the entire presentation and complete the evaluation immediately following. Thank you for participating in this EPO webinar. The presentation will begin shortly. This presentation will provide information regarding a student's access to sound in regards to their type of hearing loss. So what are the types of hearing loss? A conductive hearing loss is caused by an issue in the outer or middle ear, as you can see as highlighted by the black circle. With this hearing loss, sound isn't conducted through the auditory system normally, so it results in a perception of the sound as muffled or reduced. Some people with conductive hearing loss may say that it sounds like they're hearing underwater. It may resolve on its own or it may need medical intervention. It can be permanent in nature or temporary, and it typically results in a mild to moderate degree of hearing loss. So what are the potential causes of conductive hearing loss? One common one we see in children are middle ear infections. They can also have earwax buildup, where earwax is plugging up the ear canal. They can have a middle ear anomaly, or they can be missing their outer ear entirely. A conductive hearing loss can also result from a hole in the eardrum. A sensory neural hearing loss involves the damage or abnormality of inner ear structures. As you can see, the inner ear is highlighted again by the black circle. This damage to inner ear structures causes distortion of the sound, in addition to the reduction of sound loudness for students. This hearing loss is typically permanent in nature, and many students with this hearing loss may require amplification. Additionally, sensory neural hearing loss may get worse over time. So what are some potential causes of sensory neural hearing loss? Well, we have hair cells in our organ of hearing, which is the cochlea, and those hair cells may be dead or damaged. Your, co your cochlea may be of an abnormal structure or size. You may also have a poor connection to your cochlea with your hearing or auditory nerve. You may also may not have a nerve at all, or that nerve may be damaged or abnormal. A mixed hearing loss is simply a combination of aspects of both conductive hearing loss and sensory neural hearing loss. And this is due to damage in both the inner and middle or outer ear. Both components are contributing to this hearing loss. So you have the softening of sound with the conductive hearing loss in addition to the distortion of sound caused by the sensory neural hearing loss. So a good example of this might be you may have a damaged inner ear and then you also have a middle ear infection contributing to the reduction of sound or you may have a hole in your eardrum in addition to a damaged nerve connection. So what type of access may a student have based on their type of hearing loss? So let's take a look at the audiogram. The audiogram is a graph of your hearing. On the left side of the graph, on the vertical axis, we have loudness levels, at the top being very soft sounds down to very loud sounds at the bottom. On the horizontal axis, we have pitches or frequencies. On the left side, very low frequencies, all the way to the right side with high frequencies. The red circles mark thresholds, or the softest sound a person can hear for the right ear, and the X marks the left ear. So a student's hearing thresholds will fall into a range of degree of hearing loss. A minimal or borderline hearing loss will fall just outside of the normal hearing range with thresholds between 16 to 25 decibels, which is the unit we use to measure hearing thresholds. Some of the impact on access may include difficulty understanding faint or distant speech, uh, more speech may be missed in the presence of background noise. They also may be unaware of subtle conversational cues in social situations. Many students with this degree of hearing loss may be described as immature or inattentive. Um, they may also be more fatigued at the end of the day. 
The term minimal hearing loss is often very misleading because this degree of hearing loss can cause great difficulty for students, particularly listening and background noise. A mild to moderate hearing loss will fall into the range of about 26 to 55 decibels. There can be delays in speech and language, they may fall behind academically, and they may exhibit more behavioral issues. Some children with this degree of hearing loss may report feelings of social isolation. They may also experience a lot of listening fatigue at the end of the day, uh, particularly when they're listening in a noisy classroom setting all day. So many of these students have been referred to as forgotten as compared to students with more severe degrees of hearing loss, even though delays are often observed. So in an academic setting, it's very important that measures are in place to help accommodate those children with mild hearing loss appropriately, including those who may not display difficulties in order to prevent these students from falling behind when academics become more difficult as they get older. A moderately severe to severe hearing loss will fall into the range of 56 to 70 decibels. Many students may miss parts of words, and conversation would have to be very loud to be understood without amplification. There also may be some speech and language delays observed. Communication with the student's peers can be significantly affected, and they may report difficulty socializing, again, particularly in noise. This also may lead to feelings of social isolation or social rejection. Many children with this severity of hearing loss will greatly benefit from traditional hearing aids, but important soft speech information may still be missed, especially in noise. For these children, it's critical to intervene as early as possible with amplification if the family's communication goal is listening and spoken language so that you avoid those speech and language delays. For school-aged children with this degree of hearing loss, an FM system is often recommended to make sure that they have access to academic instruction, especially in a noisy classroom. A severe to profound hearing loss will fall into the range of 71 to 120 decibels. Without amplification, they will probably only hear very loud noises that are close to the ear. And with amplification, they're typically unable to perceive all important high-pitched speech sounds. They may potentially be a candidate for cochlear implantation, and hearing aids for all of these children may not provide sufficient benefit in order for them to develop their spoken language appropriately. For sign language development, family members must be involved in very, at the very early stage. Early intervention is key for these students. Interaction with peers may also be difficult. If the family's communication goal is listening in spoken language, early intervention is crucial for this population. A child with this degree of hearing loss will not develop spoken language appropriately without amplification or cochlear implantation. Should a visual language be chosen as the primary communication mode, such as American Sign Language, it's important that the family is heavily involved in learning and communicating in American Sign Language around the child at all times. In a school setting, access to instruction is a key concern. For spoken language users, the student may be wearing their personal technology, such as hearing aids or cochlear implants, throughout the entire school day, as well as an FM system to help with listening and noise. A student who uses sign language may need an academic interpreter, depending on their school or classroom placement, to allow access to academic instruction. A high frequency hearing loss can have a big impact on a student's ability to hear, even though they have normal access to low frequency sounds. You may hear what's being said, but you might miss some important speech sounds. Even with just hearing loss in the high frequencies, you can still miss up to 20 to 30% of vital speech information. You may consistently miss high frequency sounds such as consonants, t, s, f. Speech production may also be affected, and amplification is often indicated to support their speech and language development. The best way I can think to describe listening with this hearing loss would be the teacher from Charlie Brown, which is the womp, 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 womp. You can hear the low frequency speech sounds like vowels, but you miss those high pitched consonants that make speech crisp and clear. This is even more difficult whenever the child is in noise. Amplification can help provide access to those high frequency speech sounds the student would most likely consistently miss. A mid-frequency or reverse slope hearing loss is when the student has better access to high frequency sounds than the mid or low frequencies, basically the exact opposite of what we just talked about. You may have trouble understanding faint or distant speech. 
you may, you may miss consonant or vowel sounds, and you still may have issues with speech production. Amplification is typically warranted. Also, students with this type of hearing loss may be accused by teachers in school of having selective listening or not paying attention. They may also experience significant listening fatigue. A fluctuating hearing loss isn't as common, but it's still pretty consistently observed in the pediatric population, and it has a lot of different causes. Children with regular ear infections often have fluctuating hearing loss. As you can imagine, if you have an ear infection with fluid in your ears, you may not be hearing as well that day. You can hear but may miss important speech fragments. And depending on the day, you may have different hearing abilities. A child may hear very well on one day and have a lot of trouble hearing on another day. These children are typically poor at identifying the changes in their own hearing abilities from day to day. They're not always great reporters on days that they're not hearing very well. This, they can often be judged as having greater issues with attention or, and they may also experience lower self-esteem. A unilateral hearing loss is when you have normal hearing in one ear and you have hearing loss in the other ear. You may hear well in some quiet situations, which is why many children with unilateral hearing loss are not perceived as having much difficulty, but they may struggle with faint or distant speech, especially in noise. We're born with two ears and we do hear best with both. So when we are only hear well with one ear, we have difficulty localizing where sound is coming from and we very particularly have issues hearing and noise. Children with unilateral hearing loss may be accused of selective hearing or having social concerns. They may also experience greater listening fatigue at the end of the day and appear to be inattentive. Auditory neuropathy is a very specific type of hearing loss that involves the abnormal or inconsistent firing of the auditory nerve. There's a very specific diagno diagnostic process to identify auditory neuropathy. Hearing levels may fluctuate from day to day, but a very typical characteristic of auditory neuropathy is that the student may have greater un difficulty understanding speech than you would imagine from looking at their audiogram. This is particularly difficult for them in noise. They may benefit from hearing aids, and some students who have very poor speech understanding may benefit from cochlear implantation. So what kind of accommodations are available to these students in a school setting? The first category for accommodations in school is technology. Most of us are very familiar with the FM systems where the teacher wears a microphone and directly transmits their voice to the student via their hearing aid or cochlear implant processor. This can also be done through a classroom sound distribution system where there's a classroom speaker that allows for amplification of the teacher's voice and, it has, and it's accessible to the entire classroom. FN systems are important in a school setting for many students, but they may not be beneficial for every student. A teacher using an FM system should be very knowledgeable in knowing when it's appropriate to use it and when you should mute the microphone, particularly in a less traditional classroom setting where children are working in group work or have interactive play with their peers. Every child, whether they have normal hearing or some degree of hearing loss would probably benefit from an improved speech signal as compared to background noise because all children struggle to listen to noise as compared to adults. This is even more difficult with children. This is even more difficult for children with hearing loss. A sound field FM system can benefit all children in the classroom, but it's often not the optimal solution for students who are deaf and hard of hearing. Modifications and communication in the classroom can also be utilized. So a couple examples for these would be the teacher enunciating clearly or slowing their rate of speech. Another really important thing to do is to face the student when you're speaking or ensure the student is paying attention before you speak to them. Many of these modifications might seem to be common sense to you, but they're often neglected. Repeating what was said may not always be as helpful as rephrasing what was said so the child can hear the question or instruction again, but in a different way. Instructional modifications may also be helpful for students who are deaf and hard of hearing. Some examples could be providing step-by-step -step instructions or captioning or scripts of lecture material. It can also include preferential seating or a buddy system for notes. Children need to be able to hear the teacher well, but also hear peers and be placed away from noise sources in the room, such as the HVAC system. Also, it's very important to frequently check for understanding. Often students who are deaf and hard of hearing are good at seeming like they understand everything that's happening, but the regular checks for understanding are very helpful. Asking the student to explain what the assignment is to see if they are off track. 
Sometimes providing a list of vocabulary words that will be involved in future class lectures can help an older student prepare for future material. In summary, it's important to consider every student's unique needs in addition to the information you receive from any audiogram from a clinical audiologist. An audiogram gives you a lot of information, but it's one small piece to an often much more complex puzzle. This presentation will cover the roles and responsibilities of an audiologist in the school system. What services are required by federal law? Well, let's look at the requirements as they pertain to students who are deaf and hard of hearing from the Individuals with Disabilities Education Improvement Act of 2004. It involves routine checking of hearing aids and cochlear implants. So basically, are they being worn? Are they functioning properly? It also requires assistive technology and maximizing accessibility. So supporting the use of technology with universal design principles and assistive technology devices to maximize accessibility. This federal mandate guarantees students who are deaf and hard of hearing a free and appropriate education in the least restrictive environment. But services for these students can look significantly different across states and even school districts. So what about in the state of Indiana? Indiana does require annual hearing screenings for students, as well as remedial measures for, for hearing impaired students. Specifically, the school corporation shall provide appropriate remedial measures and correctional devices. So what does this actually mean? So the descriptions of required services allow quite a bit of room for interpretation. Indiana does not require that a school district provide the services of an audiologist. So these interpretations can vary greatly across the state. How does hearing loss affect education? An educationally significant hearing loss will potentially interfere with access to classroom instruction and impact a student's ability to communicate, learn, and develop relationships with peers. So appropriate educational management of a student who's deaf and hard of hearing is really the sharing of responsibility by a whole team of professionals in order to promote best outcomes. This team can include teachers, speech language pathologists, school nurses, and teachers of the deaf. Most audiologists do not work directly in an educational environment, or at least in the state of Indiana. So what is the cutoff for an educationally significant hearing loss? If a student is a listening and spoken language communicator, all levels of hearing loss have the potential to be educationally significant. Hidden struggles may exist for listening in the classroom, and hearing devices do not restore or fix a child's hearing to normal hearing. This is different from eyeglasses, which can typically correct to normal vision. Students who are deaf and hard of hearing may not always perceive speech as clearly as their hearing peers, even with hearing aids. Important speech information may be missed entirely, especially for those with greater degrees of hearing loss. You may often have to work harder to listen than hearing peers. Fewer cognitive resources are left after listening so hard to comprehend the meaning of instruction, let alone integrate this information into your long-term memory. In an ideal world, every school district would have a full-time audiologist that serves all of their students who are deaf and hard of hearing. They would handle all of your identification and prevention needs. The advantages to a school-based audiologist are numerous. Some services may be obvious, such as the management of hearing assistive technology, but some services of an educational audiologist may surprise you. They can also analyze classroom noise and acoustics, establish, implement, and manage hearing conservation programs, and recommend classroom and instructional accommodations. Here are some other examples of audiology in the schools. An educational audiologist can also provide valuable classroom observation. The best way to know how a student is doing in the classroom is to directly observe them. So they have the benefits of their clinical background but are able to observe in a classroom setting. They can collaborate with teachers and other school staff in order to gather relevant functional data. And this is very valuable information to add. This can help greatly with recommendations for improving classroom acoustics, special listening needs, and needs or use of hearing assistive technology, but directly in the classroom situation. Don't have an audiologist working at your school? Join the club. Most of Indiana does not. Many states do not require educational audiology services in their school districts, despite numerous benefits. 
What you can do is work very closely with your child's managing clinical audiologist to understand how to interpret their testing results. So what do we do when life gives us lemons? We make lemonade. If you have no audiologist on staff, how do you make the most of the clinical information that you're getting from the managing audiologist? Well, the first step is to maintain a relationship with the student's managing audiologist. This makes life a lot easier when you have questions or technology breakdowns. The next thing you can do is share important information data and observations with the audiologist so that they can incorporate your important observations into clinical decision making. Additionally, it's important to request updated clinical information after the student has audiology appointments. So what type of information would you be getting from the student's managing audiologist? Well, let's go over some of the important responsibilities of their audiologist. Number one is to know how the child is hearing with their technology through functional listening measures. Also, relevant speech testing is important in order to relate results to communication access. And also ensuring that their hearing aids or cochlear implant processors are optimally fit or mapped and functioning well. So let's look at these more specifically. This is an aided audiogram. So what phonemes are accessible to the child listening with their hearing technology? This is a helpful validation tool. It helps you get a basic understanding of what the student has access to when they're wearing their hearing technology. But it really doesn't give you the whole picture. Further speech testing is needed to help us understand the functional benefit. This testing is more to confirm the student has access to specific frequencies that correspond to speech sounds but this is in a controlled environment, listening in a quiet sound booth. This is also a good tool to evaluate the differences with and without their hearing technology. An aided or with hearing technology audiogram may help understand audibility of speech sounds, but what are they doing with this audibility? And this is what's important to measure with relevant speech testing. The student's functional performance, understanding what is their functional performance, understanding speech in a controlled environment. In terms of phonemic awareness, you can test in quiet versus noise, or at louder levels and softer levels. You can even test with the FM system or without. You can also use words versus connected speech, and all of these different testing methods can give you valuable information. Results can be used as a tool to support recommendations for intervention services and recommendations for assistive listening technology. But it's really important to understand that speech perception testing in the booth does not negate the need for functional listening assessments in the classroom. If you're interested in a specific speech perception test, you can look at our complete presentation entitled Speech Perception Testing for more detailed information. The last is real ear verification. This is basically a visual representation that measures the speech audibility with the student's hearing aids or their FM system. What you see here is the student's hearing levels. The left ear is on the left of your screen and the right ear is on the right of your screen. The green targets that you see are targets for the hearing aid gain or amount of amplification the student should be the student's hearing aids should be reaching in order for them to have optimal access to speech sounds across all of those frequencies. If the student's hearing aids are not verified using these evidence-based procedures, there's a very good chance the student is underfit. That means they do not have adequate access to sound. If you add having underfit hearing aids to the inherent disadvantage of the atypical speech perception that the student has, you may have created even more barriers to their academic success. This is important specifically for typical rate of school progress. Like school professionals, pediatric audiologists have huge caseloads and they have very little extra time. They have information that's helpful to you to help identify educational implications and appropriate accommodations for students in the classroom. It's very important to establish a good working relationship with the student's clinical audiologist. This can help you understand their clinical reports and they can also help you whenever you have technology breakdowns or concerns. The goal is to best support the student academically with the information at hand despite all of the barriers that we face. In summary, collaboration is key. It's important to work with the school team as well as the managing audiologist. It's beneficial for the schools to share their knowledge and information of the student with the audiologist and vice versa. This presentation will highlight speech perception testing completed by an audiologist and what that looks like for you working in the school. 
The recognition of speech is obviously of great interest and priority to speech and hearing professionals. Speech perception testing, reasons for completing speech perception testing will be to measure speech understanding, estimate a child's access to sound, or compare their abilities to hear speech as compared to hearing peers. So if you're working with a student who's deaf and hard of hearing and you receive their audiogram, the acronyms and the percentages under the speech testing results can seem really confusing or feel very arbitrary if you don't understand the purpose of speech testing or the basics of how they're administered. There is a method to the madness, I promise. There are many common misconceptions regarding speech testing measures completed on an audiogram that will be addressed in this presentation. In order to understand audiological testing, you have to first understand how auditory skills develop and how they are dependent on one another. More complex auditory skills cannot be developed until you've mastered more basic skills. A baby wouldn't be expected to start running before they can stand or walk. Detection is the foundation of auditory skills. When the audiologist finds a child's hearing thresholds, or those X's and O's on the audiogram, detection is what you are measuring. However, if you look at Erber's hierarchy, this is the most basic listening skill a child can have. The audiogram is important for understanding the type and severity of hearing loss and programming amplification, but the information from thresholds alone are limited in regards to a child's listening abilities. This is why good quality speech testing is necessary to understand the auditory skills of a child. The skills include detection, discrimination of sound, which is discerning if two sounds are the same or different, or the identification of speech, which is applying labels to speech stimuli and the comprehension, which is understanding the meaning of the sound or the message. An audiogram is a quick snapshot to estimate what, they may, what a student may have access to in regards to speech. This is a measure of detection, again, and this information is valuable, but it's very limited. As we can see the audiogram with the thresholds plotted, which are just the softest sounds that the student are hearing. Let's look up some speech audiometry tests specifically. A speech awareness threshold, it's also known as a speech detection thres threshold, is the most basic speech measurement. This is typically used for infants and young toddlers to determine the softest level that they will respond to speech. It gives you a general idea of their hearing levels and what the child has access to. It can be obtained using play audiometry or visual reinforcement audiometry. It can give you some information about hearing in both ears if they're wearing headphones. It can sometimes be the most information you can re reliably obtain from a baby or a small child. Young children and babies respond much better to speech than tones and other stimuli, so this information is very valuable for this age range. A speech recognition threshold can be used with both children and adults. It's a cross-check for your pure tone testing, and it estimates the softest level that familiar words can be correctly identified at least 50% of the time. Notice I have identified underlined here. This is the auditory skill we discussed on Erber's hierarchy. The child correctly identifies the word by repeating it or pointing to a picture. The stimulus for speech reception threshold testing are spondees, which are two-syllable words pronounced with equal stress on each syllable. The child is familiarized with the set of words before testing, and the intensity or volume of the sound is adjusted procedurally until a threshold of correct identification is established. You can modify this test for young children using a spondee picture board, which is for children approximately three to four and a half years developmental age, where the child can point to the picture instead of saying the word back to you. Every child is different. Some children may need the board at five or six to maintain their attention, while some two-year-olds can point to the pictures with the best of them. It's especially helpful for younger children or children with articulation concerns. Older children and adults with developmental delays may also benefit from using the board. The audiogram we're familiar with will have a section with speech audiometry information that everyone may not be so familiar with. This is an example of documenting the SRT on an audiogram and what that might look like. The stimulus is marked as spondees, or those words with those two syllable words with equal stress, and a level in decibels indicating the threshold obtained. As you can see for this child, they had a 30 dB SRT in the right ear and a 35 dB SRT in the left ear. Word recognition is designed to evaluate a student's recognition of speech stimuli. It's measured in a percentage of words correctly identified, and it can estimate their ability to recognize single words. 
It can also help determine amplification candidacy as well as for cochlear implants. You can do it in quiet. You can present them in noise at easily audible levels or at soft levels and with or without visual cues. This type of testing is called super threshold testing. So it's designed to be presented at a comfortable and audible level. This level may vary based on what information the clinician is trying to obtain. There are variations of this type of testing, such as closed set versus open set. A closed set test requires picture pointing, a picture pointing response with a limited set of choices. It can be a modified word list for young children or older children with developmental delays. An example of this would be the WIPI, or Word Intelligibility by Picture Identification, or NU Chips. An open set word list has no pictures, and the child will repeat the word that they heard. This is a list of monosyllabic words used with older children and adults. The words may differ in their level of difficulty, and a list should be chosen based on the child's receptive vocabulary skills. A good example of this for your students would be a phonetically balanced kindergarten list, or a PBK. Here are some examples of a closed list set. The WIPI is on your left side of the screen, and NU chips are on the right side of the screen. The child would point to the picture corresponding with the word that they heard. Now we'll discuss presentation methods and scoring. The level that the word list is presented at can be in reference to the child's 2000 Hertz threshold, but clinicians may use multiple methods. It is also best practice to present with recorded materials rather than a monitored live voice. The word lists are typically presented in each ear and then they're scored in terms of percentage of words identified correctly. This is an example of what a word recognition score may look like on an audiogram. As you can see, they have PBK listed as the type of word list, and they indicate that the word list was recorded. The child got 86% of the words correct in their right ear when listening at a level of 55 dB. They also were able to identify 86% of the words correctly in the left ear when listening at a level of 60 dB. There are some common misconceptions about word recognition testing. There are some common misconceptions about word recognition scores. First off, it does not equal speech discrimination. While the child must certainly build on the more basic task of discrimination in order to identify the words, a word recognition score is not a task of discrimination, but of identification. This skill is more advanced. In fact, no test in our standard audiological test battery directly evaluates an individual's ability to discriminate sound. We typically test detection and identification. Although discrimination is an important building block in the tower of auditory skills, go ahead and throw that term out when you discuss this on an audiogram. It's also important to understand that word recognition scores are not an exact representation of how a child will understand speech in all conditions. It's administered in a sound-treated booth, which is a very quiet, controlled, and ideal listening environment. Word testing in quiet can provide valuable information, but like the audiogram, it's limited. Ultimately, this is just a score. It does not give you all of the information regarding a child's abilities. So testing we do in the booth or in the clinic can allow us to estimate what a student's listening and understanding abilities are, but how do we get real-world speech understanding information? There are different things we can do to try to estimate a child's speech understanding in a real-world situation. One way you can do that is to modify the type of test that you administer. You can administer a test using words, or you can do it using sentences. And there are pros and cons to doing both of these. For example, one of the pros to using a single word list is that it assesses the child's ability to understand speech without the context clues of sentences. It also provides greater insight into phonemic errors related to hearing. On the other end of this, if you use sentences, one of the pros is that it's a more realistic measure. We listen to connected speech or sentences every day. Also, the listener can use context clues to guess words, and this can be a pro or a con. Just some food for thought, we can consider that performance on sentence tasks may provide insight into potential confounding factors, helping to paint a picture of the whole child. This information has great merit, but it can be problematic if you're trying to determine amplification benefit alone. There is no absolute formula for the best way to test all children in all situations. It's important for the pediatric audiologist to think critically when choosing testing conditions and when choosing stimulus. It's best to consider what information is of highest priority to obtain and promote best outcomes for the student. 
Another way to estimate listening in the real world is to use speech and noise testing. This testing involves speech materials that are presented with competing background noise. It can be used, completed using words or sentences. You can have speech noise or multi-talk or babble. You can also have the noise level fixed at a particular intensity or have increasing or fluctuating levels of noise. While this testing is completed in a sound-treated booth, it is the most real-world testing in a speech audiometry test battery. Different speech and noise tests exist that can be used with both children and adults. However, it really is important to choose a test that has high validity and reliability and is also age appropriate. This is some of the most important test information an audiologist can provide. Often speech and noise testing, often for speech and noise testing, results are reported in terms of a signal to noise ratio loss. This is a helpful tool for estimating how a child may understand speech in presence of competing background noise when you compare them to their hearing peers. This difference in performance is the signal to noise ratio loss. It's also helpful when making recommendations for FM systems to the school. Using speech and noise measures can help strengthen your argument if it reveals that a student may struggle to hear a noise as compared to their hearing peers. This can be a more objective tool for advocating for the child in a school system. No one who works in the school system needs to be reminded of how incredibly loud that environment can be. A child without hearing loss cannot hear as well in noise as an adult. So imagine how difficult it can be for a child with hearing loss. Here is a measurement from our testing that can be used to advocate for an FM system for a child to directly compare how they're performing in noise as compared to normal hearing peers. This is important and an often overlooked piece of our report. This is an example of what speech and noise testing results may look like on an audiogram. As you see, they have the type of speech and noise test they used, which in this case is the bkb sen which is a common pediatric speech and noise test. And you can see that they reported the SNR loss for both right and left ears. In summary, the audiogram is our old faithful friend, but it is very limited in what it tells us. It's really just a superficial view of ability. You can think of the iceberg effect. 90% of the child's ability is under the surface. Speech audiometry is a measure of how to estimate how well a child is understanding speech in various conditions, such as quiet versus noise, words versus sentences, closed versus open set. This information may help us understand their abilities and needs in an academic setting, and it's very useful in conjunction with evaluations and observations by other professionals. This presentation will highlight some of the do's and don'ts of hearing screenings. The Individuals with Disabilities Education Act of 2004 includes Child Find, which requires all school districts to locate, identify, and evaluate all children with disabilities from birth through school exit, regardless of the severity of their disabilities. This obligation to identify all children who may need special education services exists even if the school is not providing special education services to the child. In Indiana, each public agency must maintain its records and provide to the Division of Special Education the following information. The number of students evaluated, the number of students determined to be students with disabilities, and the number of students served. So what is a hearing screening? This can identify children to most likely have a peripheral hearing loss with the potential to interfere with educational needs. This is a past refer procedure that helps identify children who are in further need of evaluation. It's often administered by SLPs or school nurses. While in an ideal world, an audiologist would be able to administer hearing screenings, it's not typically cost effective for the school system to do this. Typically, a speech language pathologist is appropriate to take on this role. In lieu of an SLP, a school nurse is often utilized. It's important that any personnel completing hearing screenings should have appropriate training procedures to learn how to calibrate and check the equipment and have appropriate follow-up procedures. So which students should have their hearing screened? Indiana mandates that students entering grades 1st, 4th, 7th, and 10th have hearing screenings. And ideally, students entering kindergarten will also have their hearing screened. Students that are entering, new students that are entering a school system should be screened. And referrals from teachers with concerns. Parents and teachers are often the first people to notice that a student's hearing may not be normal. They may report issues with attention or following directions. Also, students undergoing testing for learning disabilities should have their hearing screened. 
No developmental diagnosis should be made until hearing loss is ruled out. If you are not certain that the child has normal access to sound, you cannot be certain of anything else. A hearing screening is the first step on this developmental investigation. While hearing loss and developmental delay can certainly coincide with one another, this is a vital first step in the evaluation process. Hearing screenings are not needed for students who are already being followed by an audiologist and already have a known managed hearing loss. So where do I screen? So these are where some of these do's and don'ts are coming into play. It's tempting to screen students in large spaces, such as a gymnasium or a cafeteria, because it's convenient. But the high level of noise and, ec and the echoic nature of the rooms greatly compromise the accuracy of your screening. This may lead to significant over-referrals, referring children with normal hearing, but they just couldn't hear the sounds well because their friends were talking 10 feet away from them, or there was a loud air conditioner that kicked on. Oftentimes, the HVAC systems can compromise screening results. When in the school environment, it can be difficult to find a separate space that is acoustically appropriate, but it's critical to find the best solution possible to improve the accuracy of your screening. So what's the best screening protocol in the schools? Well, let's think of what makes a good screening program. You should have a high sensitivity rate, so you should be able to measure how well the screening detects students with hearing loss. But you should also have a high specificity rate, which measures how well the screening test rules out those who do not have a hearing loss. So how do we keep all of this in mind and remain cost effective and time efficient? So how do we screen? Developing a good protocol can help with these issues. The first step to any screening program is to notify the families ahead of time that you'll be performing hearing screenings. You should also perform a listening check with the equipment prior to screening to make sure that it's functioning appropriately. Don't screen if you have any concerns about the functioning of the equipment or if you are beyond the calibration date of the equipment. You should screen under headphones presenting the levels at 20 dB for 1000 Hz, 2000 Hz, and 4000 Hz. You can either have the child raise their hand or say, I hear it, as a response. You can also consider screening at 6000 Hz to help identify noise-induced hearing loss for school-aged children. Our world is becoming increasingly noisy. More noise-induced hearing loss is documented at younger ages. Adding 6,000 hertz can help monitor for noise-induced hearing loss. So remember, the screening is a pass or a refer. You pass if the responses are judged to be reliable, but if you have no responses at any frequency, you should reposition the headphones to make sure they're on well, re-instruct the child to make sure that they understood the task, and re-screen immediately. If the student passes the immediate rescreen, it's a pass. If the student still refers, or they're unable to condition to the listening task or respond reliably, it's a refer. Regardless of whether the child isn't responding because they don't hear it, or they aren't responding because they can't condition to the task after two screens, a full diagnostic evaluation with an audiologist is warranted. So what are some of the reasons for referral? It could be that the room is simply too noisy. Refer back to the do's and don'ts of where you should test. You need a room that is as quiet as possible. It could be that some students simply do not understand the listening task. Some kids are difficult to test. Depending on their developmental status, modifications could be made to help them condition. It could be that the student has an undiagnosed permanent hearing loss, or they have a temporary hearing loss because they have a middle ear infection. Imagine listening with your ears feeling full of fluid. It's hard. It could also mean that the student is malingering or faking a hearing loss for personal re reasons. Oh, the malingerers. Sometimes kids, especially preteens and pre teens, can exaggerate hearing loss, either intentionally or unintentionally. There can be many reasons, but a referral to an audiologist is key. We know how to sniff this out, and we have tricks up our sleeve to help redirect them. What do we do if a student refers? Well, we rescreen in approximately four to six weeks. Also, families should be notified if the student refers the second screening. You can do this via a phone call, email, or letter, and sometimes a phone call or email conversation with the family can help you get additional background information. A referred student should be recommended for a full audiological evaluation within six to eight weeks with a licensed audiologist. You should also document the results of the hearing screening and follow up with families of students who referred to obtain the medical or audiological results from their evaluation. Also, if a student is identified with permanent hearing loss, you should recommend a full multidisciplinary assessment to help determine if they're eligible for services at school. So what are the do's and don'ts of screening? 
It can be tempting to pass a child who didn't reliably respond if you think they likely heard it. While tempting, it's better to over-refer than to neglect a referral and miss a potential hearing loss. Do only screen at 20 dB. You're not trying to find threshold. Do vary the timing of presentation of tones and present sounds more than once. If the student is not responding or it seems like they don't understand, adjust the headphones and re-instruct them. Follow up with families if there are abnormal results. Do not pass a child who didn't respond because they're probably fine. Do not assume a child has normal hearing if you suspect that they did not understand the listening task. So let's discuss some middle ear issues. Students in preschool, kindergarten, and first grade are at much higher risk for a referred hearing screening due to a middle ear infection. This is a critical period of language development and good audition is critical. Tympanometry is a measure that audiologists use to measure middle function. Students who do not pass their hearing screening should be followed up with their primary care provider for medical evaluation of their ears. A failed hearing screening is an indication for follow-up with parents for recommendation of a medical evaluation with the child's primary care provider. Even fluctuating fluid throughout this critical time period can negatively affect access to speech and language. In summary, school hearing screenings are vital to ensuring that all students have appropriate access to sound. We know that your time and your resources are limited, but developing good protocols will maximize the success of your program and make it the most time efficient. There are many reasons why a student may refer, but it always warrants a report to the family and a recommendation for a follow-up evaluation. You may notice that testing procedures that work with older students may not work for younger students. If they can go to an audiologist, we have modified testing techniques that can be performed. For all of you who have been trained, go screen some students. This presentation will cover information regarding using headphones in the classroom, but for students who have hearing aids. Anyone who spends any time in the world of education understands how often computers are used for individual classroom instruction. Approximately 97% of classrooms surveyed had one or more computers in their classroom. Teachers also reported that their students use computers in their classroom during instructional time up to 40%, and this was only in 2009. A common way for students to access academic materials without disturbing the rest of the class is through the use of headphones. But wait, this student has hearing aids. Should I just put the headphones over top of the hearing aids? Well, the answer is no, and we can explain why. Feedback, the screeching terror. Acoustic feedback happens when amplified sound escapes from the hearing aids, is picked up again by the microphone and re-amplified, and it results in a feedback loop that creates a very terrible audible tonal squeal. It happens when the microphones behind the ear come into too close of contact with another person or object. This can happen when you're wearing a hat or giving someone a hug. It can also happen when you try to put on headphones over top of the hearing aids. So there has to be a better way. First of all, wearing headphones over your hearing aids is pretty physically uncomfortable, particularly if it's for an extended period of time and in a regular schedule. It's pushing up against the hearing aid and the ear mold can rub on the skin in unpleasant ways. This can cause sore spots. The student may even need to take a break from their hearing aid in order for it to heal. Obviously, this is not ideal. So how can students with he hearing aids have the benefit of headphones? So there are a couple ways they can do this, with FM receivers and transmitters, or streaming technology or induction technology. I want you to try to think of the hearing aids as headphones, and it's so much simpler than it looks. Hearing aids themselves can be used as their own personal earbuds for use with computers, televisions, laptops, or really anything that's an external audio source. It can be connected with the help of equipment that you may already be using every day with the student. The technology in modern day hearing aids are incredible. Students are basically wearing tiny computers on their ears. So let's utilize this in addition to FM technology they may already be using. All right, so what can we use with this? You may recognize some of these devices. These are commonly used FM devices or assistive listening technology. As you can see, we have FM receivers and transmitters, streaming technology, induction loop technology, all of these can be used as, to help the student use their hearing aids as headphones. This list is just to give you an idea of how many devices can be used for this. Which one of these devices do you work with? Do any of these names look familiar to you? How do we do this? You can get help from an audiologist. 
Most of these devices have an auxiliary port, which will allow sound from the external source to be directly transmitted to their personal listening devices. The first simple step in determining if your technology can be used for this is to find out if it has an auxiliary port or a headphone jack. Then it can most likely be used to connect to an external audio source. Are you getting excited yet? <laughs> Let's learn more. So what type of devices are used to do this? Many of these are already commonly used in schools and you may already be using them. So we realize you may still feel totally lost. This is expected and it's okay. We know your plates are full, but you have resources and you have people to go to for help. Don't forget about the user manual. These are such helpful tools and they come with all of the equipment. And if you've lost yours, that's okay too. You can find them on the manufacturer's website. The websites for the manufacturers also post YouTube or instructional videos onto their website. They have countless downloads. You can learn so much from them. It is the age of the internet after all. Manufacturers also typically have an audiologist on call to answer any technology-related questions you have. Don't hesitate to call them. They are there to support you. If you're still confused, call your Center for Deaf and Hard of Hearing Education Regional Audiologist. They can point you in the right direction. To sum it all up, there's a seemingly huge variety in equipment and manufacturers. It can make the simplest task feel very daunting with assistive listening technology. Just remember that sending external audio from a computer to the student's hearing aids is simple, and it's the best way for a student to access instruction on the computer. You have resources and people to help you. You don't have to figure out everything on your own. My name is Robin Toma, and I'm the project coordinator for the PASS project. On behalf of Indiana Hands and Voices, the Center for Deaf and Hard of Hearing Education, and the PASS project, we want to thank the presenter. I realize that some of you may have questions regarding today's presentation. Due to time constraints, we ask that you share your questions in the space provided on the evaluation. The presenter will address each of these questions, and answers will be sent to all participants via email. In order to receive a certificate of attendance for participating in today's webinar, you will need to take a moment to complete the webinar review and evaluation. The link to complete this survey was sent to you in the same email as the webinar link. The survey includes two questions that ensure completion of the webinar and additional evaluation questions. We are asking that you complete the survey by this Monday at 4 p.m. Certificates of attendance will be sent via email in one to two weeks. If you have any questions regarding the webinar review and evaluation, feel free to contact Robin Toma. We want to thank you for participating in today's webinar. We hope that the information provided will benefit your practice. We look forward to your participation in future webinars and trainings.